this discussion about power reducing identities and how we can use them. So we're going to start by finding out where do these uh, mysterious identities come from. And they come from none other than our double angle identities. So we are going to start by looking at those. And in particular, we're going to look at a couple specific identities. And notice that in, in these identities, we have a sine squared and a cosine squared. We're going to use those to actually solve for sine squared and cosine squared of alpha. So if you look at this first one, if I solve for sine squared of alpha, we would have to subtract 1 and divide by negative 2. So we would end up, when you divide by that negative 2, those signs would change. So we would end up with this function of sine squared of alpha is equal to 1 minus cosine of 2 alpha, all divided by 2. Similarly, if we solve for cosine squared of alpha, we would add 1 and divide by 2, and we would end up with something like this. 1 plus the cosine of 2 alpha divided by 2 is equal to cosine squared of alpha. Now to get the tangent squared of alpha, what we're going to do, we are not going to use these formulas. We're actually going to use what we know about the tangent of an angle being equivalent to the sine of that angle divided by its cosine. So I can take these two uh, functions, sine squared and cosine squared of alpha, and divide them. So I've got 1 minus cosine of 2 alpha over 2 in the numerator, 1 plus the cosine of 2 alpha over 2 in the denominator. And then I can clean this up a little bit because since they're both divided by 2, I could just multiply both the numerator and the denominator by 2. And these denominators, these little minor denominators, would just divide away. So we would end up with 1 minus the cosine of 2 alpha over 1 plus the cosine of 2 alpha. So these identities are helpful and useful if we wanted to take a trig function that's raised to a power and express it as a trig function that's not raised to a power. So you see this cosine squared here, and this cosine in this expression is not raised to a power. We may have a coefficient, but no power on that on the function. Okay, so the function is going to be taken down a notch. Ah, there's nothing like taking something down a notch when we don't need all that power. All right, so let's take a look. Here we have the cosine to the fourth power of x. So we want to rewrite it as an expression with a first degree trig function. In other words, the trig function needs to be not raised to any powers. Power is 1. Okay, so we're going to walk through this process and we're going to use those power reducing identities. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to take this cosine to the fourth of x and we're going to rewrite it as a power of cosine squared of x because our identity is in that form. Cosine squared of something is equal to. Okay, so let's take this function and rewrite it as cosine squared of x and that whole thing being squared because the cosine squared of x times the cosine squared of x is the cosine to the fourth of x. Okay, next thing we're going to do, we are going to use the power reducing identity for the cosine function. So look up for a second at that identity. The cosine squared of something is equal to 1 plus the cosine of twice that something over 2. Now I want to draw your attention to the, these two arguments. Notice that on this left hand side where we have the squared function, we have one argument, okay? But when we take it and reduce its power, we actually double the argument. Okay, that's important. That's important. So what we're going to do here is you see this cosine squared of x. We're going to replace that cosine squared with what's on the right hand side. So it's just going to be 1 plus cosine of 2x over 2. Okay, So we're going to replace this with this part. It's going to look like this. 1 plus the cosine of 2x 
over two. So all we've done is taken that inside piece and replace it with what it's identical to, what the identity says is equal to. All right, sounds good. So the next thing we're going to do is we're gonna factor out the one half. Do you see this one half here? We're taking this expression and dividing it by two. Another way to think about that is taking that expression and multiplying it by one half. So we're gonna rewrite it in that form. That's going to make our expansion a little easier. Okay, so all we did here is we notice if I were to distribute this through, I'd have one half plus cosine of two x over two, one half plus cosine of two x over two. It's the same thing in a little bit of a different form. And like I said, that will make our multiplication a little bit easier. All right, next thing we're going to do, we're gonna actually square this thing. So we see that it is expressed as the square of this whole expression. So let's write it as multiplied by itself. So like this, one half of one plus cosine of two x times one half times one plus cosine of two x. This is gonna set us up so we can see how we're going to multiply. So let's go ahead and multiply that out. We can take these, these two values here and just call that one fourth, one half times one half is one fourth. And then we're gonna multiply this one plus cosine of two x times one plus cosine of two x. Now, I can do this because when you multiply multiple things together, uh, a times B times C times D, it doesn't matter if I multiply them in that order or not. I can multiply A times D times B times C and get the same result. That's because multiplication is commutative. So we're capitalizing on this here because this is A times B times C times D and I'm just gonna multiply the A times the C and get, that, get rid of that and then I'll multiply the B times the D in a second. Okay, so that's the one fourth bit right there. If I was to expand this, I would multiply one times one, that would give us this one. I would multiply one times the cosine of two x. I would multiply this cosine of two x times one, and then I'd have two of those cosines of two x. And then I'd multiply cosine of two x times cosine of two x, which is cosine squared of two x. Beautiful, okay, so, so far so good. Now, we are well on our way to completion, but remember that our instructions were to rewrite the expression so that it is an expression with a first degree trig function. We have taken our fourth degree and brought it down to a second degree, but we want it to be a first degree. So we're gonna take this and apply the power reducing identity again just to this term, okay? So remember that if we look at this formula, if this is a 2x, then what would this have to be? Well, this is double. So if this is a 2x, this is going to have to be a 4x. So we're going to replace that expression with this. So we're going to replace that squared cosine expression with this right-hand side, and this argument will be 4x. All right, so... Notice that that's exactly what we've done here. That's the only thing that we've done here. And the next step would be then to separate these two terms. Okay, so this is the same as one half plus one half cosine of four x. So we're going to separate those out. And then we're going to distribute that one fourth all the way through. So here, 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 and here. So multiply that out, let's take a look. Looks like this, one fourth times one is one fourth, one fourth times two cosine of two x is two fourths or one half cosine of two x. One fourth times the one half is one eighth. One fourth times the one half of cosine of four x is one eighth cosine of four x. And we want to combine our like terms. So there's two like terms here that we can put together and that's only the one fourth and the one eighth. One fourth is the same as two eighths. So when I add that to the one eighth, that can be expressed as a value of three eighths. And so that would be our last step. So three eighths plus one half cosine of two x plus one eighth cosine of four x. Notice that no trig function is raised to any powers. And that's what we wanted to see happen here. So that's how you use a power reducing formula. I'll see you next time when we talk about half-angle identities.